So my name is Philip Martin, and I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery here in Los Angeles with my partner, Portia Hine. And I hope you've had a chance to stop by the gallery or see us at the fairs. We just opened a new space in Glassell Park, which is really fantastic. It's on the east side of Los Angeles. It's a rich area with lots of great restaurants, lots of rich things to do, lots of um, studios and things like that. So if you're around, come by. I'm delighted to be speaking with Lisa Sanditz today. Um, thrilled to be working with her. She's in preparation for a show uh, at Huxley Parlor in London, and there's a fun studio shot here for you to enjoy. She's also currently in our show Pocket Universe at the gallery and in a wonderful show at Modern Art in London um, called The Moth and the Thunderclap, which is about uh, kind of references to Birchfield. How are you doing today, Lisa? Thanks for joining me. I'm great. Um, we're between uh, winter storms up here in the Northeast. Um, knowing that you have recently finished a snowstorm there. Yes. Unusual, an unusual conversation topic to start it, with. I will say that it is um, very, very strange. You know, growing up in Bloomington, Indiana, there was always this, uh, we would always watch the Rose Bowl and they would always be like here in sunny Pasadena, California. And I don't know, you know, for other people in the Midwest, but that was always like, what is this Pasadena, California? And then to suddenly be here in my life. And then it has been the, the craziest weather week. I've never seen anything like it, like snow on the mountains right behind us. Which in some senses is an interesting place to start with your work because you're very affected by landscape. Yeah, absolutely. And I was gonna say as a fellow Midwesterner too, and um, I, I think it seems pretty evident that I've traveled around a lot. I make a lot of paintings in responses to places I've been um, and thinking about Los Angeles too. It, it always seemed so exotic, but then the sort of, um, you know, one of those ubiquitous things of the American landscape, um, no matter where you are outside of a city, the sort of endless strip malls. So um, I always think that LA in weird ways looks like St. Louis. I can't speak to Bloomington. I haven't spent time there, but <laughs> the horizontal. Um, you know, it's interesting how LA is a city that is just um, has so many surprises in it. And here, I think right off the bat, we're seeing two paintings of yours, this really fantastic work that's in the show at Modern Art. Um, and then this amazing painting of a Dollar Tree uh, which would be obviously a very, you know, different kind of a American landscape. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, here we go here, right. Go, go right into the strip mall, <laughs> strip mall zone here. The, the, the piece before it, um, referencing something a little more pastoral. Um, I did a series of these, uh, and have continued to these sort of inverted, um, walking paintings where the landscape sort of is oriented, mm -hmm. um, in line with sort of the regular rules of gravity and sort of post pandemic um, feeling just really disoriented. So I've made a number of paintings where the figure is moving through the space in a different orientation. And this one um, too, that sort of cold winter Northeast palette, and then just trying mm -hmm. to like find a little pop glimmer of color in, in the piece. Um, whereas Dollar Tree was thinking more, um, I mean, I'm both thinking a lot about color and painting itself and the way, the ways, the unique ways that one can put an image together within a painting. Mm -hmm. So thinking about the everyday Dollar Tree, um, the sort of like everydayness of, uh, you know, just a shopping experience, getting your mm -hmm. basic needs. Um, and uh, it's a little harder to see, but there's a little car in there with a person alone with their little illuminated, um, it's pretty hard to see on this, but that's why you have to go to the gallery to see it in person if you're in LA peoples. Um, alone, illuminated, and the sort of kind of, you know, empty feeling I think there can be with a lot of um, shopping experience and the sort of sickening glow of the store alluring one inside. And then the name of the place too, I think, um, you know, language, uh, yeah. I often kind of find to be playful. Um, and titles to like Dollar Tree and the idea of like the, the the sort of low value I think we place on a lot of things in the natural world, like that a tree, you know, valuing a tree at a dollar. And then a lot of the objects inside, 
that can provide goods for people at a low cost, but a lot of them are really also made really, you know, poorly, have a very low value too. So that, you know, thinking about colors, way to cut across some of these things and open an entry point, but then, um, you know, these other kind of conflicting experiences of consumerism. Um, well, you also, you know, you have this kind of grand sky. And I think what you're saying is, is one of the things that's very attractive to me about your work is just that you're very much a kind of both and kind of painter, um, not someone who's scared to sort of tell the whole picture, pushing, pushing the painting in order to, to kind of present that to your viewer. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I think that is the case. And I think, um, you know, there's just like a lot of different ways to enter a scene or a converse, or start a conversation with a painting. And I think I used to think every painting had to have everything all the time. Mm -hmm. And now sometimes, as you'll see, like even what we're gonna look at in the next little bit here, some are more like pointed towards a certain, you know, specific place or story, shared event or personal event. And then some are a little more of an open enigmatic read like this piece, um, Night Walks. Um, I also did, I did this painting this summer um, and it's kind of out of this continuation of a lot of paintings I did mm -hmm. post pandemic where I did a lot of walking with friends. There was really nothing else to do time-wise or, you know, a way to interact with people. Um, and this is a painting of the uh, the Tivoli Bays where near where I live, and it's a very kind of iconic location in the sort of history of um, you know the Hudson River School painters. Um, it has that continuum too, mm -hmm. and um, and then also you know thinking of the sort of the like all of the eeriness and uh, that evening the darkness can can open up in a, in a story and an experience too. Well, these paintings were featured in works were featured in a show we did called Night Painting. And I think one of the ideas about that show, and it came to have different meanings for different artists, is that in a certain sense, you can't paint at night because you can't see what you're doing. So you under yourself in this place where you have to locate memory or locate a feeling of place. This is just has a beautiful sense of, of being in the environment. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's funny that you say that because a lot of painters probably aren't plain air painters anyway, like aren't painting at night outside in the dark, right? I mean, <laughs> right. I can't think I only know of one who's also the mayor of Tivoli, um, mm -hmm. Joel Griffith, paints it outside with lights. Um, but, you know, I do a decent amount of plein air painting, but would something like this would come back to the studio to work on something. But now I'm like, ooh, night painting challenge. Let's actually paint at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, John Rippendorf, who has Green Gallery, does a lot of paintings outside at night. And I think, you know, there's something to be said for painting directly from the scene. It influences your sense of color, your sense of touch. Um, is that true in your work? Yeah, I think, um, yes. I think, And sometimes I get, think people can see the difference. Um, you know, we'll get to some that I did on site and then I often come back in the studio to work back into them. Um, I mean, I think there's something that, yes, it affects the touch, the sight, the like restrictions of materials, the restriction of time. It has limitations that I think can be useful for myself and other people. Mm -hmm. um, this one, I did a drawing in the car on site. Um, it's wow. again near my house um, off of Kid Lane, if anyone the locals on the, on the call here. Um, and I also, uh, the foreground is um, thinking of red or purple, red and white clover. Mm -hmm. um, I also did a project um, with the coal site and amazing friend artist, Emily Sarter, where we collaborated and did these sort of wacky naturalist guides. And so I got a lot more informed about um, the sort of local ecosystem and pollen producers. So I did the clover field foregrounded after uh -huh. that project. How much this, uh, and then this is a piece that was in the recent show of uh, called Unnatural Landscapes at Aquavella. And yeah. Behind you. Exactly. <laughs> um, um, so this one, I mean, the story is like more pointed here, but maybe the interpretation is um, mm -hmm. 
I don't know, more open. You know, we're sitting here talking. I'm telling you when I'm thinking about it. I, most people will just see an image and just make their own conclusion. But there are more like specific indicators here. The painting is called Vax Clinic Two Day. There's a little sign in the painting that uh, indicates that too. Um, and as somebody who's painted the American landscape for now, you know, two decades. Yeah. Um, early on, I painted a Best Buy strip mall, which since um, this Best Buy near us was abandoned and then turned into a vaccine clinic a couple oh, wow. years ago. So um, things move fast in the American landscape if you're if you're paying attention. Um, yeah. So that was kind of the entry point to this. Yeah, I, uh, I heard a quotation that I had never heard uh, that time is an excellent teacher, but unfortunately it kills all its pupils. <laughs> so fickle time. <laughs> This one is called Mud Hike, and this is a study for the painting. So, again, you talked about locating yourself in the lands in the landscape. Um, and yeah, do you want to talk a little bit more about this? I do because this is a, a California inspired piece. Um, okay. And in fact, I'm working on a different um, hot off the presses from my my brain to yours, Philip. I'm working yeah. on another interpretation of this because oh, I nice. like aspects of it but I want to and this happens sometimes I do things one off and sometimes I want to kind of like work through it again mm -hmm. and um, so last holiday winter holiday I was with my sister who lives in the Los Feliz Hills and her um her her husband and her, her our families together and we went on a hike in Griffith Park mm -hmm. and it was when there was so much rain and it yeah. was so unbelievably muddy that we were just like you know concrete amounts of mud on the bottom of each shoe and just sliding down the mountain and the mud was all over so it's called holiday mud hike um so i'm gonna approach that one again too what makes you want to go back into a painting what do you how does that work well i think sometimes i feel like i solve the problem and then sometimes i think the problem could be solved in a different way or yeah a better way. In fact, like now I can't even, I had ideas about how I wanted to do it. Oh, I think, it, yeah. Yes. Um, I just want to, I think I, I, I really want to pull out more the mud quality um, yeah. than this sort of, I had this idea of the clouds and the trees kind of in this like shape kind of uh, conversation back and forth, but I want to foreground the slipperiness of the landscape in the next one. We'll see if I can do it. I make a lot of, I ruin a lot of paintings, so I'll keep you posted. Is that part of the process? I think so. Yeah. Um, what is apparently, it? Apparently it's part of the process. <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm like oh, heading out to um, ruin a painting. I mean, I teach, you know, I teach at Bard. Mm -hmm. and, um, there's a lot of, you know, successes and frustrations in being a beginner painter and yeah. I'm like I'll paint for an entire year and throw not I have them not a single painting that I like that not this year and not last year but you know there have been years so yeah you know how do you kind of how do you kind of work with that creatively it's just part of the process right yeah enjoy the try to enjoy the I definitely enjoy the uh when they come together but kind of yeah. move through, move through the the challenges but well I mean I think that's one of the things that I really like about your work is it feels like there's really something at stake I mean I there's a kind of risk that's in there that means that I see things in these paintings that I've never seen before um you know I've never seen things presented this way and then you also just do amazing <laughs> I love I love this painting so much you know, that's good this one is like pretty this is this is on the verge of being like pretty wacky I think uh, for, formally, well, maybe even narratively, but um, just there's a lot going on with the color palette. Uh, yeah. Um, well, it, it also speaks to me because I went, so my son and I went to Zuma Beach here when he was younger. And we've had a lot of seagull interactions. Uh, we had an epic seagull interaction when it stole all of our Cheez-Its when we were in uh, Montana de Oro, which was really upsetting to my four-year-old. And then on this particular occasion, I thought we were in the clear because we were on Zuma Beach with plastic dinosaurs, which are clearly not edible. And this seagull swooped down and <laughs> took one of the plastic dinosaurs. And 
then the hilarious part is that um, I went to school. Well, I was picking him up from school. He was in pre-K. And I had this kind of interaction with his teacher where they're like, you know, um, Asa was making some drawings. He seemed very anxious. And uh, he's inventing these stories about seagulls stealing his dinosaurs. And I think there was some implication that he was possibly processing like familial trauma through his drawings of the dinosaurs. And I was like, um, that actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I was thinking that sounds like an amazing painting, but he, you he already made it. You yeah. already made it. I don't well, he that. already made it too. But, that, <laughs> but also dinosaurs, because then it pulls into this whole like evolutionary circle too, right? That yeah. are like plastic dinosaurs made out. Plastic dinosaurs are in fact made out of dinosaurs, right? Because yeah. they're made out of petroleum. And, <laughs> and then the and then the bird is like also a dinosaur. So it's yeah. kind of like a nice little extra extra loop there. Well, I think when you approach the art object with these kind of open-ended possibilities, like as you're saying, intellectually, visually flowing back in there, you can create that kind of possibility. But you have to create a certain kind of space and positivity to do that. You know, um, you know, I think that for you to say that you can go a whole year and not walk away with a painting that you feel good about. I mean, that just is scary as hell to me, but it's also, <laughs> I'm not an artist. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, the, you know, it doesn't feel good, but, no. but also um, I think that's just the territory I do. I mean, I don't even know if I can do it in the other way. It's just like the, yeah. the inventiveness is what, and the story and is what keeps me invested. Well, I think one comes to this with the hope that you're going to do something. I always have these hopes that I'm going to be able to paint a certain kind of painting or do, you know, when I got my MFA yeah. and whatnot. But then the reality is that, is that you just stick with the process and try to be as organic, seemingly, and open as possible. And then where you're really going, I don't know, do we even really have any control over all those things? Somehow, sometimes it seems like we don't. <laughs> I don't, yes, I don't know. I mean, yes, we do, but also there's just a lot of, so many var variables. I mean, a million, yeah. right? Especially once you start painting. I mean, you know, you're a painter. Also, P.S. owning a business also sounds scary. So, you know, it's just, there's, <laughs> we all do what we, what we can do or, can, you know, keep our mind in. Um, like this one, the, that last one and this one I painted, there's, these are plein air paintings on site. Yeah. Um, that one I did, hot, sticky summer day, swampy, mm -hmm. you know, Lots of mm -hmm. that was a, lots of a bug spray to get yeah. through that painting. Um, the next one, actually, um, this is a really nice, interesting feeling opposed to here because here you do have a kind of grand yeah. landscape view, totally. and you talked about the Hudson River School, yeah. um, and here you definitely feel very much in this painting. Can't um, you hear the mosquitoes? You really can. And it's interesting with this piece, because I've looked at it a few different times. And at first, you know, it's such an all over that starting to kind of distinguish what, what the different parts of the scene are doing and the reflectivity of the pond and such, you, you do come to this point where you are feel that you're very much inside of it. Well, and this painting is 12 by 16 inches and the one before is like 70 by 54. Mm -hmm. So it's like a whole, you know, we're looking at it as like equivalent on this screen, but it's like just a totally different experience. I've never painted plain air like this kind of scale outside, which could be exciting. Um, it would take a whole other like, you know, organize, organizing to make that happen. But um, well, you're gonna, I don't know how people deal with the wind at that size. Yeah. You could like tape it to a van, like uh, strap it to the side of a van. I've, 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 I have thought clever. of it. That would be cool, but I haven't done it. That would be, that seems very clever. Yeah, I'll keep you posted. Where was this one done? Um, this one was done like in April of last spring um, on the sort of a commute to um, taking my kid to school, just kind of like a sort of roadside, just saw that kind of that dark, that black tree that was a later bloom than the other early spring mm -hmm. trees. Um, and then just kind of started pushing the paint around and then basically got to it without that pink 
sky. And then the, and the next day I was just like boring and came in and was like <laughs> pink sky, brought that and then brought that tree back on top of it. And then I was like, okay. So what you're saying then is that this line underneath is yeah. the previous. Oh, so that's, that's back when it was boring. Oh, interesting. I mean, that's for really me, interesting. I don't know. You know, and then that pink is that early spring, you know, that is yeah. taking the color out of the landscape too, that early like bud pink. That's fantastic. Um, now here, I thought that we might just have a chance to kind of look at in the remaining time, we have about, you know, five or 10 minutes of just the show that you did at Huxley Parlor during COVID. Um, it's a beautiful group of works and the Huxley Parlor is in London. And it's a beautiful, beautiful um, working with, with a variety of different themes. And I wondered if you want to talk about putting a show together or some of the thoughts that maybe went into this. Sure. Um, I mean, I think at least in the last couple of years and perhaps a result of COVID and certainly the political landscape we live in, I've um, just the sort of personal narrative and public narrative seems to be so inevitably like intertwined at least mm -hmm. for me and, and so um i've included more like personal stories um in conversation with other um maybe something that's like more of an external uh story and others that are just kind of like located grounded in the landscape itself so mm -hmm. Um, and before maybe I would have been a little bit more focused. So the, the last couple shows I've had have had, um, so you could go like to the, that's like, um, my husband, Tim Davis on a hike, um, after hike again, COVID, all you can do is walk. This is like, um, this is called grandma's got a gun. This is kind of think reminiscing about being a bad teenager. I don't even know if my parents are on here, but there's still things that they don't need to know about. Um, and as, as a as a parent of a 10 year old who's going to be hopefully making different choices um and like being at friend's house where there are no parents around um and just like all of the kind of like mayhem late night mayhem that we kind of did um mm -hmm. you know doing this at, you know as, during the trump era where this just sort of felt like you know being living in a country where there's just like nobody is kind of looking out for anyone else's best interest um and, um, you know, and I'm um, just kind of using the formal devices to make kind of that joyous chaos of, you know, that of uh, a lot of like slipping of colors and stuff like that. Um, and then just like a quieter still life um, of um, dying flowers. I think, you know, thinking about death inevitably a lot during um, COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so something like quieter and more intimate, yeah. Well, I think, you know, this whole, it's it's interesting where painting has located itself for me, especially during this time. I mean, the ability to express one's personal vision in relationship to the society that we're living in, whether you're talking about social media or strip malls taking over the landscape, there's a very powerful part of that. And your hand is so direct. I was sitting here listening to you talking and thinking, I was like, gosh, should I ask Lisa if she's an action painter? Kind of meaning that in the Harold Rosenberg sense. But then I was also thinking about, you know, not only is the, they're the personal in terms of the embodiment of yourself and the paintings, but as you also point out so in terms of not just the material content, but subject matter wise, those things are really, is that resonant with you at all? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, you know, I think I'm an action painter, landscape, figurative, you know, all of the things like not really in one, um, exactly one corner, but um, I talk with my students a lot about shoulder painting and wrist painting, you know, like take uh -huh. your shoulder going, move your shoulder and then like now get to your wrist. So I'm thinking of that too. Um, um, and, you know, and also the relationship to like land and changes in the land and moving itself, like that's a very physical um, experience moving through land and thinking about all of the ch changes natural or in the built environment. How long have you been upstate? Um, we got our house 19 years ago, but so back and forth with the city, so a while back and forth with the city and then mostly here and, you know, I used to travel, but been really definitely here in the last few years, mostly. Well, and also you are going upstate then probably a lot 
you were really kind of one of the first people then to probably start going upstate, at least in terms of artists moving from the city up upstate. I mean, there were people like when we moved up here, Amy Silman was up here, Nicole Eisenman was up here, you know, Stephen Shore is still here, like in terms of names that you might be familiar. Yeah, with. There's, sure. um, but, it, you know, it's different now, but yeah, people have been. No, it's just interesting. I hadn't really thought I have a friend who moved, they moved to Saugerties and I think, you know, 2005 and sure. it was kind of the first time, you know, you, the people, you know, start, you know, I'm not from that area. Yeah started having that kind of connection. Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about that, that we should talk about? Um, what color your shoes are today? My shoes? Yeah, I have some special blue ones. You're uh, wearing your blue boots? I'm not wearing them currently. Okay. <laughs> but I have, I have them. Also, um, someone is saying here that they, uh, they've always, loved your everything all the time paintings and the show that you did abroad and also point out the Lois Dodd point out paint outside at night oh my gosh good now we can get a list going that one I did uh, this is based on a painting this is a view this is a fantastic painting I have to say yeah that one I painted after seeing a dead fox on the side of the road and mm -hmm. a, you know a juvenile bright red fox and the idea and just like how glorious it was and um tried to give it its own new it's extended uh permanent life in a in a painting um and like the feeling of headlights kind of illuminating that but so I did that from a night scene but you know back back in the studio that's really beautiful well it's really been great to talk to you thanks so much for doing this with me I really appreciate it and likewise it's really been great to talk to you and really great to um keep connecting all these years and reconnecting now Philip and yeah Ryan. Well, Lisa's in the fantastic show currently at Modern Art. The show at uh, uh, Huxley Parlor opens pretty soon. Next, next week. Next week. Mm -hmm. And then her, she currently has work in Pocket Universe. If you're in LA, please come see us and uh, Glassell Park. And then we're going to be doing a show coming up and a few other things down the line. So there'll be lots of opportunities to get to learn more about what Lisa's doing or see more if you're already a huge fan. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate Thank it. You. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.